We're going to take a little break from the book of Romans. Ben finished up chapter 7 of Romans last week, and we learned about the, the struggle that even the Apostle Paul had with sin. And so none of us are immune to that. But today we're going to switch gears for just one week and jump into the book of 1 Peter. So if you want to turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1, we're going to look at verses 3 through 9. It's a wonderful passage, and I'm going to be reading from the English Standard, Ver English Standard Version, ESV. You may have a different version, but uh, the ESV is what we'll be using. So if some of the words are a little bit different. You may have King James or NIV or one of the others. But Peter writes, beginning in verse 3 of chapter 1, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. Though you do not now see Him, you believe in Him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Just a brief prayer. Father, may your Holy Spirit be moving among us today. May you soften hearts, and unplug ears, open eyes, and soften minds to the message of the gospel. And may you be glorified in all that we say and do. In Christ's name, amen. So, Fizi and Yael were good friends during their high school years. And in 2012, they decided to attend the same college together in Cairo. A few classmates who happened to be Christians invited them to join a comparative study on the major world religions. And so they read and discussed through the texts of the various major religions of the world. But it was the words of Jesus in the Bible, particularly his compassion and mercy, that captivated their hearts. And within a couple of months, both Fizi and Yael submitted their lives to Christ. Just one problem... These young Egyptian men were raised in a conservative Muslim family. Families who were vehemently opposed to the words of Christ and Christianity. They both understood the danger in such a decision. Leaving Islam could cost them their life. And for Wael, that was the fatal outcome. When his family learned about his decision to follow Christ, they made plans to kill him. And a few short days later, he was followed and, and run down by a car driven by his own uncle. Upon hearing the news, Faizi knew who could be next. And two weeks later, he was attacked by Muslim friends. Friends he had faithfully shared the gospel with. They took him and they beat him, cut off three of his fingers. And Faizi confessed to his shame that since that day he decided to hide the truth of his Christian faith from those in his own family. He eventually recovered from that attack and he moved away and he got a job and he married another Christian convert named Maisa. They currently have two children and they've been raising them as Christians. In 2022, while visiting his parents back in Cairo, one of Faizi's young sons began to sing one of the Christian hymns he's been learning at home. And his father, who's a leader in the local mosque, got a little suspicious. And he confiscated Fizi's computer, in which he found a lot of Christian websites and messages. And so Fizi took his family and he fled. He got his children out of there before his father could lash out at him. And he was able to escape from Egypt, but Maisa's family kidnapped her and the children. And they're holding her now. They won't let her join the husband because they consider him to be a blasphemer and an infidel. So we look at our passage today, we see that the Apostle Peter places an emphasis on the 
likelihood of sufferings and trials and afflictions in the lives of Christians. In fact, this letter was written to encourage those who were undergoing persecution in the first century church. Peter's writing from Rome, probably around 65 AD, where he's no doubt witnessed some atrocities against Christians. He tells his readers to stand fast, to persevere. The return of Christ and the consummation of the kingdom is a promise that we can trust. Now, if we glance up at the greeting at the beginning of the letter, look up at verse 1. We can see his target audience. He says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Elect exiles of the dispersion. That's language that really goes back to the Babylonian captivity when the Jews were taken out of their homeland and transferred to that kingdom by Nebuchadnezzar. However, Peter has in mind here Christians of both the Jewish and Gentile background. They're living now in provinces of Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey, and they're under the rule of the Roman Empire. So what Peter's really saying here is that because of your identity in Christ, you're viewed as exiled Israel because Christ is the true Israel. And by God's sovereignty, we're members of his kingdom. And that makes us elect exiles here on earth. So with that kind of background on 1 Peter, let's jump into our text. The passage here, I mean, as I was studying this, I said, you know what? You can make a sermon series out of verses 3 to 5 alone. It's so powerful. There's so much in there, but we don't have that kind of time. So let's make the best use we can this morning. I want to point out three of the main points that Peter wants us to get here out of this passage. They all begin with the letter B, so it's easy to follow. First of all, we're going to talk about being blessed by the second birth, and then beset by temporary trials, and then finally, believe by faith. Believe by faith. So as you look at being blessed by the second birth, you see Peter begins there in verse 3 by offering a blessing to God. Immediately we see the reason for it. It's because of his great mercy. His great mercy. What kind of mercy is that? The mercy because the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Mercy because all the wrath that we deserved was poured out on Christ, who was our substitute. And now we're just a few weeks from Easter, three weeks to be exact from today. We may be more inclined to focus more on the cross than normal. What what was it about that cross? What was it about Christ that we're so interested in it? To do that, we really should go back to the Old Testament especially those first five books. We go back to Genesis through Deuteronomy. And even a a cursory reading through there, we discover a couple things. We find out that God is holy. He is other than. He is set apart. He is above all. He's without sin. He is like a brilliant white. We also learn he's full of abundant mercy and grace. We see it there in the tabernacle, do we not? In that system of offerings and sacrifices done by the priests. We see it later in the temple. And what we learn is that God was revealing to us that he was willing to accept the death of a substitute to pay for the penalty that would otherwise fall on his people. The life of an animal in place of a life of a human. The New Testament book of Hebrews explains that all this was a copy and a shadow of the things to come a copy of the reality that hasn't appeared yet. In other words, it was like looking through a fog or a mist down the corridors of time until the Messiah, Jesus Christ, appeared. The Old Testament prophet Isaiah in the 8th century B.C. spent several chapters describing an obedient servant, one who would come and pay the price for his people to redeem them. And no doubt you've heard these words or read them yourself from Isaiah 53. The prophet writes, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. On him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. That's speaking of none other than Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God in human flesh, the second of the Trinity. Now, I think it's natural for us as humans to focus on the physical aspects of the suffering of Christ the pain that he went through, the pain he endured. And that's rightly so because we're physical beings. We we can appreciate what he went through. 
But what I want you to do is think about something else. You know, we've watched it in movies, haven't we? There's, a, there's a, been a couple of movies that show graphically explaining, you know, the crown of thorns and the, the scourging, the beatings, and finally the brutality of the cross. But for just a moment, if you can, I want you to let your mind go beyond the physical into that unseen realm where scriptures talk about it became dark for three hours as Christ hung on the cross. And, and the father, as it were, turned his back on the son. He was abandoned. The place where Calvin says, no one should wonder that Christ is said to have descended into hell since he suffered the death which God's wrath lays upon evildoers. And Sinclair Ferguson's helpful here too. He describes it this way. He says, Jesus was taken through the power of the Spirit into the no man's land between heaven and earth. In that lonely wilderness where he bore our sins, he experienced an indescribable sense of alienation from God. He was rejected by man and tasted death as the wages of our sin and as the curse of God. That pretty much explains it. It goes beyond even the physical suffering we read in the Gospels that he sweat even drops of blood as he anticipated not just the anguish physically as a human, but as a divinity in him, knowing to be abandoned by the Father. So the death of Christ did indeed pay the penalty for our sin. We know that to be true. And by his resurrection, he defeated our greatest enemy, and that is death. And this is where Peter says, God has caused us to be born again to a living hope. By re regeneration from the Holy Spirit, and by our faith, our, our belief in everything that Christ has done on the cross, says we're born again to a living hope. We're blessed by the second birth. We're born again to worship and serve a living Savior. He's alive. Verse 4 provides more good news. See, it says our salvation is described as an inheritance. Now, inheritance is not something that you go out and purchase an inheritance is something that you're given, something that you receive from someone else. I don't know about you or your family, but neither my wife, Jenny, or I have any wealthy relatives that I know about. I don't know that anything's coming our way, but even if we had rich relatives, even if they were leaving us millions, it could not compare to the priceless treasure that we have in Christ. It's the precious blood of Christ, Peter says, that saves us, more precious and valuable than silver or gold. And best of all, Peter tells us it's eternal and it's secure. So I have a question for you. Have you ever, <laughs> I've done this so I'm laughing myself. You ever cleaned out your refrigerator after a long time and, and you found something like way in the back in the corner? You know, some leftovers that were forgotten about. And, and, and when you finally take them out and you look, it doesn't even resemble food anymore. Look, in fact, it looks like some kind of alien blob that's got some fuzzy stuff growing on. It may be green and brown, orange color. And you say, I, there's no way I could ever eat that. It's been defiled by bacteria and mold and who knows what else. Well, this is kind of a, a visual image that all physical things eventually become decayed. Eventually, they perish and suffer corruption. All physical things, some sooner than others, of course. But Peter says those who Christ has redeemed are not only heirs of eternal life, but also heirs of a new glorified body, like Christ received in his resurrection. You see, our inheritance is imperishable. And so because it's imperishable, it'll be untouched by death. It'll be unstained by evil. It'll be unimpaired by time. And by God's power being guarded, as it says, Guarded there, if you look in the text, that it's a Greek word for, a, it's a military term, for like a sentry guarding the fort. Our, our salvation is being guarded for us, protected by faith until our salvation is completed at the return of Christ. When he comes to consummate the kingdom, we receive those new glorified bodies and all that right now. It's being guarded. It's as if you, you, know, you go to a wedding sometimes and you check the chart and you have your names on there and it tells you what table you're at. You already have a place where you're to be seated. And that's how... We're positioned because of our faith in Christ. It's already been done for us. We await his return and the consummation of the kingdom.
But Peter goes on to say in the beginning of verse 6, this assurance of eternal life and everything that Christ provides in our salvation should be a source of joy, and rightly so. Great joy. We should preach that to ourselves every day when you wake up. Thank you for another day. What, what joy it is to know that I'm taken care of now and I'm preserved for eternity. But between now and then, there's bound to be some rough times. We'll be beset by temporary trials. Of course, we live in a fallen world, and we all suffer the common things that people have to go through, the difficulties of life, sickness, war, pandemics, economic crises, political turmoil, violence, natural disasters, just to name a few. But we also see in the text that these trials can come from different places. If you look there at the beginning of verse 6, Actually, it's probably in the middle of verse 6. Peter writes this. He says, Though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials. And I, as I was saying that, I, I kind of honed in on that word, that little phrase, if necessary. What, what does that mean? It's the only other version close to that was the King James. Where he says, if necessary. And we know from Scripture sometimes that God will send trials our way usually for the purpose of building our faith. For instance, if we look at Genesis 22, we are privy to some information that Abraham did not have. And that's when he was told to take his son up on the mountain and sacrifice him as a burnt offering. The text says God tested Abraham. He never intended him to harm his son Isaac, but Abraham didn't know that. It was a test. God was using this as an exercise to build the faith of Abraham. And he is considered to be the great man of faith all throughout Scripture. You see, faith is like a muscle. The muscle. You can stand there all day and say, I've got great faith, but until it's tried and tested, it doesn't have any strength. There's no way to quantify it. But the more faith gets worked, the stronger it gets, the more it gets built up. And so God will sometimes send afflictions our way. Not only to build our faith, but also to make us to depend on Him. That we know that when He gets us through a trial, we can look back and say, the Lord was with me, the Lord protected me. And it even helps to alleviate some of our fears that we may have. It helps to alleviate fears when we know that God is sovereign over our lives. I often quote Matthew Henry, the Puritan commentator. He writes about this. He says, God does not trouble His people willingly, but He acts with judgment in proportion to our needs. These troubles which cause sorrow never come to us except when we need them and never remain any longer than necessary. You may feel like you're going through a trial and you're suffering unjustly, but the Lord may be using it for a purpose, and we may never know that purpose until we meet Him later. But what Peter does here, he then uses an analogy of the testing of our faith to the purity of used to get gold and silver, that refining process. How about you? I've never done any gold mining. I've never done any prospecting. I've never done any refining. But it is an unusual and unique process. What happens is the the miner, whoever that is working, the metal worker, will take that ore, which is the metal with all kinds of impurities, and they'll put it into a crucible and then heat it up. Now, for gold, the melting point of gold is 1,948 degrees, almost 2,000 degrees. And when that goes into a liquid, the gold is heavier, sinks to the bottom, the the impurities are on top, and they skim them off. And they keep repeating that process over and over until the refiner can see his reflection in the pure metal. And he knows that he's got the job done. And so it took that intense heat, it took that inflammation of that metal to get the pure form. And so Peter's telling us that the trials of afflictions help to purify our faith. This is something that's done both to silver and gold. You see a lot of it in the, in the scriptures. And maybe, maybe Peter got this. If you go to Psalm 66.10, the psalmist writes this. He says, For you, O God, tested us. You refined us like silver. Who brought those afflictions? God did. The prophet Zechariah, chapter 13, verse 9. He writes this, he says, I will put them into the fire and refine them as one refined silver and test them like gold. So sometimes that will happen to us. We don't know where it comes from, 
but ultimately we may find out someday that it was the Lord who brought the trial. But Peter also wants to prepare his readers in the first century, these readers, that the persecution that may come because they simply proclaim the name of Christ. I mentioned earlier that Peter lived in Rome at this time and during the, the, the reign of the Emperor Nero in the mid-60s A.D., and there were some cruelties done to Christians at that time. We get a little hint if we go to chapter 4, look at verse 12. Peter writes this, he said, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you. You think, why is he saying fiery trial? Well, one of the things that Nero would do, as cruel as it is, he would take tar and pitch and cover the Christians with them and light them on fire and use that to light up his gardens at night. That's just one example. At the time this letter was written, there was not an empire-wide persecution, but there were sporadic outbreaks. The empire-wide persecution came most severely during the 3rd century, during the 200 of ADs. But at this time, Peter wants people to know that it may be painful. There may be persecutions that come, and it, it may be painful, it may cost you, but remain faithful. You will be rewarded. Persevere to the end. Come to faith and use the Lord's power. Verse 7 says you'll be rewarded by, the, the reward will be praise and glory and honor when Jesus returns at the end of the age. He wants them to know, and certainly Peter's not alone in reminding Christians of trials and afflictions. Jesus talked about him as well. Did he not with his disciples? Remember in John 15, he said, if the world hates you, know that they hated me first. And if they persecuted me, they're also going to persecute you. In agreement, Paul and James and Jude wrote about the certainty of suffering as well. And their message is all the same. Use the trials to draw closer to the Lord. Go to him in prayer. Spend that time with him in prayer. Depend on his strength to persevere and to build your faith. As I studied this more, I looked and I said, you know what, Jesus Christ... That name is offensive to the majority of people on this planet. He was in the first century, and he's just as offensive in the 21st century. And there's no doubt a variety of reasons for that, but I believe the main one is this. I believe the fact that Christ represents that we are sinners who cannot save ourselves. Our good works earn no favor with God, and people don't understand grace. They want to earn their way, and if you look at another, we mentioned Islam already. That's one of the religions. You have to earn your way. You have to do works. The prophet Isaiah says your deeds are as filthy rags. They count for nothing with God. We're simply saved by dying to self and trusting in faith alone in the finished work of Christ. It's all by grace. It's been given to us as a gift. And so it is offensive, that message you know, proclaim that in a Muslim country or a Hindu country. It may cost you your life to say that your works count for nothing. It's all by faith in Christ. And it's certainly not a popular message in our Western culture either, is it? Where in many places you're told, even in churches, God loves you just the way you are. He loves you just like you are. The most important thing is to be true to yourself. How many times have we heard that? That's not how God thinks. We know from Scripture. That's why it's important to sit under good teaching and preaching and to be in God's Word all the other six days of the week. Because even though we know that the elect we see in the Scriptures, the elect of God come from every tribe and language and people and nation, we see daily evidence that there's people from every tribe and language and nation who despise the message of the gospel. Some of you probably have heard of the voice of the martyrs. Voice of the Martyrs is an organization that serves persecuted Christians around the world. It was founded in the United States in 1967 by Richard Wormbrand. Now, Wormbrand was a pastor who was kidnapped, beaten, and tortured post-World War II by the communists in Romania. He spent years and years in prison. They used to take him and beat the bottom of his feet until the bone was exposed, and he spent years in prison. Solitary confinement, really cruel. He and his wife, Sabina, fled Romania, came to the United States, and 
founded that organization in 1967. So they served Christians around the world. And they came up with uh, some statistics through the end of 2023 that I wanted to share with you concerning about persecution, since we're talking about that. First of all, this. Christians are the most persecuted people group on earth. 2023 alone, 365 million people were subjected to high levels of persecution. Christians. One in seven Christians worldwide are persecuted for their faith. One out of every seven. And this one's really chilling. Every two hours, a Christian is killed for following Christ somewhere in the world. Every two hours. And we saw evidence of that, right, in the opening story about Phizi and Wael, that persecution comes. So what do we do? Peter was warning them about persecution coming. It was happening in the empire. But what do we do now? Well, first of all, I would say we should praise God for his mercy because persecution like that has not come to us at this point. It's not occurred yet. But what we should do is be on our knees asking him for wisdom and courage for when it does arrive. For it's coming. The message of the cross is, is a, an offense to people. So let's keep that in mind as we do it. And we praise for, pray for courage to stand up to persecution, and it may cost us. That's what Peter's telling him. The best perspective, though, I think, on persevering through trials and persecutions comes from the Apostle Paul, his second letter to the Corinthians in chapter 4. He's agreeing with Peter. They knew each other. and I don't think they collaborated on this, but listen to what Paul writes in chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians. He says, This light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As you look, not to the things that are seen, but to things that are unseen. Because the things that are seen are transient. The things that are unseen are eternal. That food back in the corner of the refrigerator is transient. The blessings we have in Christ are eternal. Prepare for the heavenly things. I was thinking about this too. I, I, it's kind of hard to think about it, but I, I know there's people out there who spend more time planning their vacation that they're going to spend a week or 10 days than they do planning for their own eternity. So those are people we need to be praying for. You may know them. So this takes us to our final section where Peter encourages readers to believe by faith. Look at what he says there in verse 8 to 9 of our text. This is really neat. He says, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible, filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Now, who wrote that? Peter did. Let's do a little, little study on Peter. Most of us know his history, do we not? If you spent time reading the Gospels, we know what Peter did. In Matthew 16, he goes from being praised for telling Jesus, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And not too much later, he's called Satan. Get behind me, Satan, because he tried to deny Christ from going to the cross. In Gethsemane, the night of his arrest, Jesus said, you know what, guys? You're all going to bail out on me. You're all going to leave me tonight. Peter said, Lord, I will never, I will never leave you. Peter, come on, man. Before that rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. And we go to Luke's gospel, and we see in chapter 22 of Luke, during the trial in the high priest's house, it's getting pretty intense in there, and the questioning on Peter got to be too much, and finally, the third time, he denies him. I don't know him, and the rooster crowed. And Luke's gospel said at that moment, Jesus turned and looked at Peter out the window, and he said, he remembered the words of Christ, and he went out and wept bitterly. On the morning of the resurrection, in, in John's gospel, he says, he calls himself the one whom Jesus loved, ran with Peter, and they went to the empty tomb because Mary had told him that he wasn't there. And John stood there looking, but Peter, you know, being Peter, he jumped inside, and what did he find? He find the grave clothes. He didn't see the Christ. He had been resurrected. They went back home scratching their head, but that night Jesus appeared to them. And then they believed. And then we see in John 21, we read how Jesus tenderly and lovingly gives Peter the opportunity to confess his love 
to reconfirm his calling as an apostle. Remember the question, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Peter, do you really love me? Tend my flock. Tend my sheep and feed them. But then we see a change in Peter. We come to Acts 2 and the Pentecost and the Holy Spirit comes and they're ignited with that boldness that comes from the Holy Spirit. And Peter goes out and becomes a great preacher of the gospel. Christ is no longer physically present with them, but the Spirit of Christ is in them, directing them and leading them, giving them boldness to proclaim the truth of the Scripture to the same people who had Christ put on the cross. Peter has become a new creation. See, he was blessed to have lived and spent time with Christ. Almost three years. His faith and belief came by seeing and hearing and listening and watching and observing and seeing the healings and seeing the miracles and ultimately seeing the resurrected Christ. That's where Peter's faith came from. But see, the elect exiles up in Asia Minor, they didn't have that luxury. They didn't have the same thing that, that, that Peter had. They didn't see Christ. They didn't hear Christ teach. They never heard him. Most likely, they were converted by one of Paul's missionary journeys as he went through Asia Minor. Paul preached the gospel to them, and now they're possessors of that imperishable inheritance. It can never be taken away from them. But what Peter's doing here is emphasizing the importance of faith. Faith. Talked about a lot in the New Testament. In fact, Hebrews 11 verse 1 defines faith. What is it? The assurance of things hoped for? The conviction of things not seen. That's how it's rendered in ESV. The Old Testament saints believed in the promises of God. They trusted in Him. We're told later in Hebrews 11, speaking of the Old Testament saints, we're looking at Abraham, we're looking at Moses, etc. It says, They died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged they were strangers and exiles on the earth. They, they never saw Jesus either. But they believed. And so these readers that Peter's writing to have to depend on faith. And we do as well. The Old Testament saints took God at his word. They lived their lives accordingly. They believed in him. So the question then is what about you? What about us? Do we, do we fall in that category? As I mentioned earlier... Discipleship out here at 9.30, Edward and I have been teaching through the Gospel of John. And John's made it a point to include a series of signs that Jesus did. Turning water into wine. Feeding the 5,000. A variety of signs that he did to prove that he was the Messiah. He was the Christ. And then he had a, a, a list of I am statements. I am the good shepherd. I am the light of the world. I am the resurrection and life. All these things John wanted us to know. The events he recorded to provide evidence about the identity of Christ. And in John chapter 20, almost at the end of the gospel, he gives us what I call his thesis statement. And if you've been here at 9 you've heard this over and over again, we're going to repeat it again. What does he say? He said, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in his book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and by believing have life in his name. Eyewitness testimony, they say. How important is it to have an eyewitness testimony? Does it mean a lot to you? If you're on trial for murder, could the eyewitness testimony has the ability to either condemn you or to have you acquitted for what they saw or what they did not see? But Peter and John are testifying to the truth of who Jesus is and what he's done to secure our salvation. Peter tells his readers, even though you don't see him, you love him. Even though you don't now see him, you believe in him. And so again, I ask, what about you? Do you believe in Jesus? Is it more than just words on a page, saying a few prayers here and there? Do you really love him? We're called to love him, to serve him, because he died for us. That's the calling for all of us. John 20, going back to John, we all know the story about doubting Thomas. 
right? Remember Doubting Thomas? That night I mentioned when Jesus appeared to the disciples in the upper room and they believed Thomas for some reason. He was out getting groceries, whatever. He wasn't there. And he, he got back and they said, we saw Jesus. He said, no, you didn't. Was it April Fool's Day? You guys are pulling my leg. No, no, we saw Jesus. He goes, I'm not going to believe until I can put my fingers into his wounds and stick my hand in his side. Then I'll believe. And sure enough, a week later, Jesus came, appeared right up to Thomas. Go ahead, Thomas. Put your fingers in the wounds of my crucifixion. Stop doubting and believe. And what's the response of Thomas? He falls on his knees, my Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. What's the response of Jesus, though? Have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed. That's what Peter's telling us. Jesus is no longer here to walk on the earth, but we must believe by the testimony that's in the Scriptures. And to believe that Jesus is to believe everything the Bible says about him. He is God incarnate, the spotless Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He suffered the wrath of God so that we could be saved from it. He died and he was placed in a tomb dead. But on the third morning, he walked out alive, never to die again. And now he lives positionally at the right hand of the Father, in heaven, interceding for us as our great high priest. In his love and mercy, he offers the gift of eternal life to anyone, anyone who comes to him in repentance and faith. It's not a secret club, a secret society. Anyone who professes the name of Christ and comes to him in repentance and faith can be saved. He is the only mediator between sinful man and holy God. Jesus himself said, no one comes to the Father but through me. And when he returns, whenever that is, whenever he comes back, anyone found outside of Christ will be sentenced to suffer the just judgment of our holy and righteous God. These are all the biblical facts. So if you're in Christ this morning, I, I pray that you sense the urgency to share the facts with the people you love. The list of four or five people that you've been praying for, I mentioned earlier, we're going to talk about them. Now here it is. Those people you have thought about in prayer. Call them up. Meet with them. Sit down at a table over a cup of coffee, whatever it is. But open the Bible and speak with them about the certainty of death. The reality of our sin. The promise of eternal life. The love of God and the importance of faith. And then be sure to reinforce it daily in your own life. We have a tendency to forget very quickly that it's all because of what he's done for us. We're not in control. So reinforce that daily. And we look at the end there, and Peter says that by believing, by believing, there's rejoicing with joy that's inexpressible and filled with glory. What is that? Obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Let's pray.